Hi there, Pastor Barney Schwenke, Faithway Baptist Church here in Leesburg, Virginia. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch the video here we're about to show you. Uh, my prayer is that God will use this sermon today in conjunction with you belonging to a good Bible teaching, Bible preaching local church where you can get involved and you can serve to help you grow in your walk with God, to make you more like Jesus Christ. I always tell our church family when they come walking through these doors, my goal as your pastor is to help you see Jesus so you don't leave the same way you came in. And that's my prayer for you today. By the way, if the message today is a blessing to your heart, would you consider giving towards the media ministry here at Faithway? It takes a lot of money to be able to produce these videos and to stream them from our website. You, you can find the description in the link below, a link to the website. And in that description, um, it'll tell you how to give and be a part of the ministry here. Thank you so much for joining us. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. Well, I am grateful to be back with you. A year ago, we were here, and that is when COVID hit. In fact, I'll never forget, we had just gone back to my home church. We are based at Eagle Heights Baptist in Kansas City, Missouri. So we have been there 27 years, and our pastor had been part of our church staff for 35 years. He was school principal, and then assistant pastor, then interim, and then he was our senior pastor for 12 years. We had just gone home for retirement for our previous pastor, Bob Francine, and after Pastor Francine's retirement, Angela, my wife and I were on the plane. Half the plane is empty. And I, I looked around, this is really weird. And I remember saying to the flight attendant, does this have something to do with that pandemic? We didn't have a word for it at that point. She's like, yeah, but we're really not talking about that, you know? And uh, so the next day, the NBA said, that's it, we're canceling our season. Now, you know when people making money cancel their season? That's a big deal. And uh, our poor... Pastor coming in, Brian Schaefer, our new pastor, came in the week COVID hit full blown, middle of March. And we had an evangelist schedule. We had drive in services at our church outdoors, you know, in April. And so our, our dear pastor has been getting his feet under him for a year, dealing with COVID, et cetera. I missed only a handful of meetings, incredibly, last year. Uh, I think five weeks of camp is all, well, one meeting in Canada because I couldn't get across the border, but uh, five weeks of camp is all I missed. You were the first week we were actually affected some by, you know, they we're figuring out how are we going to do this. Your governor had not really put any mandates yet, but I remember half the crowd, we went live stream. And the most vulnerable crowd, supposedly the 70 and above, they're all sitting right here in the front. I asked them, what are you guys doing here? Like, hey, brother, if we die, we're going to heaven. We're happy. So... So they were here, troopers, and nothing, hell or high water when you keep them away. And we had a, a great time together. And then I went to Brother Phillips' church. I'm parked down at Triumph Baptist this week, as I often do. I'll be with them two weeks from now for a week-long meeting. It was a totally live stream meeting. Total, in fact, their little chapel where they were meeting, they now have a brand new building, but their little chapel there at Vint Hill didn't have Wi-Fi. So we were doing hot spots off of a phone and I'm preaching an entire week. We went Sunday through Friday. I know I've been with these people every year for 12 straight years, but we went Sunday through Friday, virtual meetings. And they would be texting in like, he's frozen, we can't hear, you know. <laughs> and they're, they're, my wife, we have a handful, like four or five people in the crowd. I'm trying to preach, and they're all on their phones, and I, I, I. So all that to say, parents, if you need to take your kids out, have at it today. I understand. I will not be distracted. I promise you that. My wife would have done children's meetings today. Angela and I have been married 27 years. She is my right arm. I am, I am at a loss when she's not with me. Um, our daughter, Heather, is 21. She has been traveling with us up to this year to do children's ministry. She's going to be transitioning out to her next thing, uh, a job in Florida after this. And so at this point, Heather would be in there with my wife. But she came down with a vertigo this week. And uh, she, to the point of vomiting the other day and then being on the couch for three days, even when we're with her cousins, my brother and uh, my sister and brother-in-law this week. And, and then we drove 360 miles yesterday through Lynchburg up US 29, little windy. That's not good for a person with vertigo. So my wife has stayed with my daughter Heather this morning to help her. Ho Angela plans to be here at least tomorrow and the next night. Hopefully both our girls... The two that are home will be with us, but uh, anyway, that's a little update. So that's our year in review. That brings us to this, this year. Can't tell you how glad I am to see people. And all year long, I'll tell you one of the ways I maintain some sense of normality. 
Um, being in church, I was in church just about every night, and we happened to be in a lot of states where either there was limited restriction or no restriction. I just came from Florida, land of freedom. And um, so we have been in church where there are people every night, and then I play golf, and you know, on golf courses, things are pretty normal, you know, and then you go biking. Uh, we live in an RV. The RV industry is booming because people figure you can go fishing and camping, and it's not like mask mandates everywhere. And so it's been amazing. Our world has been fairly normal, but I know we're all pining to get back to real normal. Uh, not new normal, you know, real normal. I want to take you to Psalm 91 this morning. I'm really glad you're in the Lord's house. Psalm 91. I appreciate Pastor inviting me in. I pray for Brother Barney and Liz and their family and for you about every three days. I, I rotate my pastors through on a list, so I am praying for you all the time. And I'm encouraged to look out and see what the Lord's doing here. Last year we started off with a pretty good crowd and then we went, you know, half a week of meetings and, and each night we were a little limited because of COVID. I would love to come back next year. I think we're on the schedule next year and just see this place packed to capacity. And I'm praying toward that end. One of the guys last year mentioned in our pre-service prayer time an, an illustration, an idea for an illustration. I'm actually opening with it. And I don't remember which of you shared this, so if it was you, come tell me later, because I, I need to give you due credit. The Greeks had a habit of worshiping gods that were made in their own image. You may have remembered in Greek mythology, they would fashion gods in their likeness. So unlike the true God who made man in his image, the Greeks concocted gods made in their image. And they had various gods for ver over various areas one was the god of the forest and the fields. He was known as the shepherd god. Is that you, brother? Shared that last year? Yeah, okay. Pan, half goat, half human. And Pan would scamper through the forest, and he was mischievous. He was uh, licentious, sometimes amiable, friendly. But he had this habit when passerby would come through the forest area, Pan would hide among the shrubbery, and he'd snap some branches. And the passerby would hear that, and there would be this sense of apprehension that would build. So he'd move along farther, the traveler, and Pan would scamper on through. And Oh, by the way, Pan was the one that played the reed pipes. You've probably heard them identified as Pan pipes. His name was Pan. Pan means all, because he was allegedly adored by all the other gods. So here he is, scampering ahead in the woods, and then he'd hide behind some bush. And the person would come by, and he'd rustle the bushes. Well, now the heart rate is increasing. And the person would hasten their steps a little bit more. And now Pan would run ahead, hide again among some brush, some shrubbery. And once in a while, he'd let out a blood-curdling scream. And by this point, the person, not sure what was in the woods, thinking they're going to be attacked, would just take off in a dead bolt running, overtaken by what became known as panic from the god Pan. I appreciate you giving that illustration last year because I've used it all year long. And uh, that was good foresight because that had just broken out. Do you remember doing that? Yeah. <laughs> when I get it, you'll get it. Okay. Where's the cash? <laughs> so he's running in fear and trepidation. Panic. It's interesting that the term pan, in our lang or pan panic rather, in our uh, English dictionary, is a sudden uncontrollable fear or anxiety often leading to wildly unthinking behavior. I have never seen such panic in our society as I have from 2020 leading into this year. I remember last year, last year started off great for me. I, I'm from Kansas City, and last year's Super Bowl, not this one, Tom Brady Super Bowl, last year's Super Bowl was really good. My team won, and I thought this is really fun, good start to the year. And then I came here right after our pastor retired, and th nothing to do with you, but all of a sudden the bottom dropped out. We had just gone through, uh, that was impeachment number one uh, at that time, and then there was the pandemic breaking out, and then there was a summer of rioting and violence, oh, peaceful protest, uh, rioting, rioting and violence all summer, and then um, pandemic and mass mandates and governors pushing their agenda, and then, let's see, that led to um, election season, um, <laughs> questionable at best elections, uh, impeachment number two, and on and on. And now, whew, 
Have you ever seen freedoms taken away at such a rapid pace? And I want to tell you something. There is, not just in society, in churches, a sense of foreboding. But I want to remind you of something. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I was studying last year um, end times theology, what's called eschatology. Eschatos is last things. Eschatos. I was just doing it for my own benefit. I was reading the book of Revelation and Daniel over and over again. Just because every man that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So I studied Bible end time prophecy for my own benefit. And I'll tell you one thing that stood out to me. In the book of Revelation chapter 7, you read the great tribulation period. That's that time when God pours out judgment on this world. And it's amazing. He sends out 144,000 Jewish evangelists, Jewish witnesses. And incredibly, during the midst of the great tribulation, I want you to think context here, the Antichrist, the world leader, is in charge of everything. He's in charge of the media. He's in charge of the military. He's in charge of, of commerce, everything. In the midst of the Great Tribulation, there are thousands upon thousands saved. In fact, the Bible describes millions coming to saving faith. If that can happen during the Great Tribulation, there is no reason we cannot see a mighty move of God right now. We should not be overcome by fear, we shouldn't be overcome by panic. This is not a time for pessimism. This is a time we ought to have renewed confidence in the Lord. I want to take you to Psalm 91 this morning. It is a psalm of promise. I'd like to have you, if you would, stand with me, if you're able to stand. Let's stand for a, a brief reading. I'm going to read verses 1 to 7. I'm calling this message today, In the Habitation of the Most High. In the Habitation of the Most High. This psalm has often been called the soldier's psalm. I think you'll see why, because of its clear promise of protection. The Lord will, and I plan to cover the whole psalm. There are 16 verses. I'll just read the first seven with you, all right, to give you some context. Psalm 91, let's read off. I'll read aloud. You just follow from verse 1 down to verse 7. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Interesting, if you look above verse 1, there's no author name. There's no inscription. If you, you go to the previous psalm, you look at Psalm 90, that is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Some have assumed, because of the similarities between the two psalms, that Moses wrote Psalm 91. We don't know. Others have said, no, no, it's, it's not uh, ascribed to anyone. It seems, though, from context, that David wrote it when David was fleeing from Saul. Okay, well, now, now Moses and David lived centuries apart. Which one wrote it? Well, the Bible didn't say. Okay, so I can see why people would like to know the background. But the more I studied, the more I came this, to the conclusion, this is a general psalm for all time. This is a psalm that God wants you to take comfort from. It applies to the people of God in all generations. And how are we to apply it? Well, go ahead and be seated. Appreciate you standing with me. I'm going to break this down into three areas. I'm going to start with this. Number one is a premise established. A premise, like promise, but P-R-E, premise established. A premise is a foundation from which you draw conclusions or a foundation on which you build. And notice the psalmist says here, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I remember developing a habit to read Christian biography when I was just a young man. And biographies I've read over the years have really been a challenge to my life, really been a blessing to me. I would encourage you to read good Christian biography. One I read was uh, Shadow of the Almighty, the life of Jim Elliott, missionary to the Alka Indians in Ecuador. And in fact, I remember my, I sat under Pastor Jim Shetler when I was in college, and Brother Shetler said it was one of the most impactful books that he'd ever read, and he said, I want to recommend it to all you, all you students. So I read it, Shadow of the Almighty. Powerful. It was based on this psalm. And here's a psalm. He says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The word dwell 
is a synonym to the word abide. One time I was out in California, and a young man came to me, a homeschool kid, and he said, hey, I'm supposed to interview a missionary or evangelist. Um, could I do an interview with you? And I said, sure. He said, I got a list of questions so you can kind of think about your answers, okay? And he said, could I meet with you tonight before church? Sure. So I looked over the questions. One of the questions was, what is your favorite chapter in the Bible? Whew, I'd never thought about that. You know, I love God's word. I mean, there's certainly some chapters I love more than others, that's for sure, okay? All scripture is profitable, but not all scripture is equally interesting. So when you get into the genealogies, it's got a purpose, but it's not exactly your most enlightening uh, devotional reading, right? Okay, so there are certainly places in the Bible I love more than others, but I thought, how do I narrow it down to one chapter? What's my favorite chapter? But I thought if I had to get it down to one, I might pick uh, John 15. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that he may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. All right, that's verses 1 to 5. The term abide means to stay in, remain in, fellowship with. Okay, so what causes us to remain in fellowship with God? Communication. Open communication. And by the way, what severs, what breaks fellowship with God? Sin does. I remember having a Bible teacher when I went to Christian school, high school years. He said this, you got to remember this, students, when it comes to matters of sin, so often we wait to the end of the day and we try to think back, oh, I did this wrong, I, I was wrong in that, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have looked at that, I shouldn't have thought that. And then we try to go through a list and confess sin. that It's kept us out of fellowship with God all day long. He said, you got to fess them when you do them, don't group them. Okay, that was a good reminder. Fess them when you do them, don't group them. What does that mean? As soon as you've done wrong, listen, if you've been paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ, if you were bought by the blood of the Lamb, once you've been born again, you have a permanent relationship with God. But while the relationship is fixed, the fellowship depends depends on time spent with God. It depends on keeping a short account with God. Fest them when you do them, don't group them. So, let me give you the premise here. The word habitation, interesting. It's your normal environment. It's the place you would expect to find a person or animal, a creature living. Like if I said, where would you expect to find a turtle? Uh, you know, a pond would be a good place to start. The middle of the interstate, you'd figure that's not the normal environment. It's not the normal habitat for a turtle, right? If I said, uh, hey, tell me about your house. I was with a man a couple weeks ago. He's, he's blind. He's been blind for years since he was a child. And we went to pick him up to take him to lunch. And he came out of his apartment. He's got a little walking stick. But he, he maneuvers around that whole apartment complex like I do with sight. He's so comfortable in his environment. Okay, the habitation... In fact, the word habitat is the place where one naturally lives. And that's the, that's the uh, root of our word habitation. It's a dwelling place. It's a place where you're at home. I remember when I was a kid, the term here, secret place, is used. I would think of a clubhouse. My dad built us a tree fort in my backyard. My dad was a general contractor. Our, our, our tree fort had uh, a cedar shake roof. It had, you know, uh, it had uh, framed windows and everything. It had two ladders to get up into it. It was incredible. Well, that was not your typical kid uh, clubhouse. I, I thought about our gang, Spanky and Alfalfa and those guys, and they, it was reruns when I was a kid, just for the record, okay? But they'd have this clubhouse, and it said, uh, boys only, no girls allowed, you know, sexism. Okay, so they had this clubhouse just for the boys. Well, think about it. Your, your secret places, that's, that's your getaway place. You know, for a married couple, maybe you have a place where you like to go when you have an anniversary. You have a certain hotel or you have a certain uh, getaway spot, and it's just you. Hey, let me ask you this. What about you and God? Do you have a secret place with God? I, I jotted this down. I don't think I have it in these notes up here, but uh, number or letter A here, personal time with God is prioritized. Personal time with God is prioritized. Notice, he that dwells, that's ongoing action, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide, that's continuous action, under the shadow of the Almighty. Ron Hamilton wrote a song called My Quiet Time. And it has many times come into my personal time with God. I 
I've sung it, I've thought of the words. He said, before I start each day, there is a special place. I love to get alone and seek my Savior's face. I find wisdom in his word to instruct me in his will, and I hear his gentle voice say, My child, be still. My quiet time alone gives me power to obey. My quiet time alone with God each day. I talk to him in prayer. Every day he meets me there. My quiet time alone with God. Those of you who have a quiet time know what I'm talking about. And by the way, those of you that have a quiet time, other people know that you have a quiet time, even though they may not know that you have a quiet time. They can see it in your disposition. They can see it because when everything around you is falling apart, you're not. And by the way, if you don't have a quiet time, it becomes apparent too. You need a daily time with God. There is personal time with God prioritized. But I want you to see this as well. Protection from God is promised. Notice this, letter B. Protection from God is promised. Look at verse 2. Having said, he that dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Okay, think of a refuge. Like if you have animals at a wildlife refuge, what is something that humans cannot do at a wildlife refuge? What would be a no-no at a refuge? You can't hunt, yeah. Can't hunt or... Like, I go out to Hawaii for meetings every other year, and we go up to the north shore of Oahu, and there's a place I really love to go out snorkeling, and it is a preserve. It's a, it's a wildlife or a fish refuge, and you can't uh, spearfish there. You can't fish there. You can't do anything to take those animals because it's a preserve. Refuge is a place of protection. Oh, notice fortress. Okay, why are fortresses built in warfare? Place of protection. So, this is the premise on which the whole psalm is established. I, I wouldn't have noticed this except in my, in my study. I got into the commentary of Dr. John Phillips, and he pointed out there are four names for God. I kind of just casually read over them. This is why every word of Scripture is important. And the four names of God used in these first two verses really bring some insight on where this whole psalm is going. He, he starts off with the term most high in verse 1. Do you see that? Verse 1 is most high. That's the Hebrew name Elyon. In English, we would spell it E-L-Y-O-N, Elyon. And you know what it means? The term has to do with possessor of heaven and earth. The possessor of heaven and earth. In other words, uh, Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. What does God own? He owns everything. He's the possessor of all that is. Okay, so what is there in the world that's outside of God's ownership or his right? Nothing is outside of God's boundaries. He made it all. He's possessor of heaven and earth. So it speaks of possession. But then you notice the next name uh, mentioned is the end of verse 1, the Almighty. Almighty. And that is the Hebrew name Shaddai. S-H-A-D, like Shad, S-H-A-D-D-A-I, Shaddai. And Shaddai has to do with a lavish provider. Lavish provider. Speaks of provision. I mean, think of this, David acknowledged, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, you remember the word? Want, I'm not going to lack for anything, God's my provider. So he's possessor, he's provider. But then you notice the term Lord in verse 2, I will say of the Lord, all capital letters, many of you know the Hebrew derivation of that word, that name is Jehovah, uh, Yahweh, we don't actually know how they said it, because the Hebrews would not say the personal name of God, we typically plug in Jehovah, but they, they substituted it with a title for God. Jehovah would be God's personal name, the name by which he affirmed a covenant. It'd be like when you sign a check, you sign your personal name. I, don't, I wouldn't sign a check Mr. Tozer. I would sign a check Rich Tozer. Okay, that's my name. Jehovah is God's personal name, but the Hebrews would substitute it with the title Adonai, A-D. O-N-A-I, Adonai, which means Lord. And that's why in the English Bible, you'll see Lord in all capital letters. What does Jehovah mean? The name literally means I am that I am. It's he who is because he always is and will be, he is forever. He's the eternal one. This speaks of his promise. That name was used in covenants being made, like Exodus chapter 6, when God made a covenant with Moses. He, He says, I am that I am, meaning... Did you dads ever make a promise that you intended to keep but you couldn't keep? 
you know, we're, we're going to go camping this weekend, and, and then it rains. Or, no, we're going to get out of town next week. We're going to Disney World, and then COVID hits. Or the boss calls you in for a meeting you didn't see coming. Okay, so perhaps you've made promises, and you feel like, I wanted to keep my promise. Guess who never had a promise that he couldn't keep? It's God, because he knows everything that's going to happen, and he has all power in heaven and earth. So, speaks of promise. And then there's one more name here used, and it is the name God, Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, Elohim. And that is God, the creator. This speaks of his power, his power. Now, I want you to notice, when you can speak all things into existence, I mean, obviously you have all power. I want you to notice he is possessor, he is provider, he is the promiser, and he is the one of all power. All of that is the basis on which this psalm is based. Okay, so we have a premise established. God, who is all that we need, is the one making the promise here. Go with me now to verse 3, if you will. Psalm 91, verse 3. And I want to give you, number two, a picture enhanced. A picture enhanced. We know that Scripture was given by inspiration of God. In fact, the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's Psalm, I'm sorry, that's uh, 2 Peter 1, 21. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know what that means? The Bible is not merely a collection of religious writings. It is divine revelation. The Bible was given from God to man. Interesting, and I've witnessed to people sometimes, and they say, you know, I have... I have no problem believing in an intelligent creator, but just this whole idea that the Bible came from God, I don't know about all that. And I ask people, if God made us in his own image, don't you think he would communicate with us? Yeah, why didn't he? He did. It's exactly what the Bible says it is. People say, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. I want to tell you something. I've read the Bible, no exaggeration, Every single day of my life since I was 15, I'm 54, I've never missed a day in nearly 40 years. I read the Bible every single day. I've read it through many, many times. I will tell you, there are no contradictions in the Bible. If somebody says to you, the Bible's full of contradictions, hand it to them and say, show me. They've heard there are contradictions. They're not contradictions. Are there ever places there appear to be contradictions? Yes. And they're understood by context. Are there places, some things in the Bible hard to be understood? Yeah. Even Peter said of Paul's writings, he says some things hard to be understood. You're not alone if you have a hard time sometimes understanding things of God. But should that surprise us? God is the absolute almighty. Think about if you were trying to explain calculus to a kindergartner. Would you have a hard time? (laughs) Frankly, if you were trying to explain calculus to me, you'd have a hard time, okay? And I'm a little more advanced than a kindergartner, but I would not get calculus. I went up to, you know... Trig 2 or whatever it was in school, and that was beyond my pay grade. Imagine being God Almighty explaining yourself to finite beings. So I try to imagine, what was it like when God, whether this was Moses or David or somebody else, the divine writer wanting to explain, wanting to uh, picture what is God like. God used their personalities, he used their vocabularies, he used their individuality to give us scripture. Okay, so we have a picture. In verses 3 through 7, I see two pictures. There's the bird analogy and the battle analogy. I'm going to start with the bird analogy. It's in uh, verse 3 and in the, down in the first part of verse 4. I, I was going to call it the uh, avian analogy and the army analogy, but I figured some people would be like, avian, what? Have you ever been to an aviary? What animal do they keep in aviaries? Birds. Yeah, so it's just simpler to say birds. Okay, so there's the bird analogy. And look here in verse 3. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Okay, folks, I I love interactions, so don't hesitate to interact with me. The snare of the fowler. uh, What do fowlers try to trap? Yeah, fowl, right? Birds, okay? And the word snare is actually a bird trap. So he'll deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And from the noisome pestilence, think about this, if you're a bird, what are the threats to your existence and to your health? Well, bird traps would be a threat. Pestilence, oh, by the way, you know what pestilence means? Widespread disease, epidemic, pandemic, same idea. Okay, he'll deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. Notice he shall cover thee with his feathers. Do you see the bird picture there? 
a missionary to Africa was working among a tribe of people that lived in the grasslands, and one day a fire broke out. It'd be like a, a prairie fire in our country. It, it, it just burned up grass huts. They, they had huts built out of clay bricks, and then the roofs were thatched, you know, and so it just did incredible damage to this, this particular area of Africa. The missionary is there trying to reach these people, and he's feeling the pain of loss, that these poverty-stricken people, that they've lost everything. He's taking a walk around the community that had been burned up, and he's walking down a trail where he commonly went, and he saw a little, what had been a bird nest or a hen's nest, thing was charred. In fact, on top was the remains of a mother hen. She had been burned to a crisp. And he took his boot and he just kind of kicked, you know, just kind of disgusted by the whole thing. He just kind of kicked at the nest and the little hen body fell off the top and out scurried a, a brood of chicks. Alive! Little chicks scurrying. And all of a sudden that missionary had a great picture to be able to use to these people he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. Because that mother hen, instinctively, had given her life to save her little brood. And in like fashion, the Son of God gave his life that you and I might live. Folks, listen, the simplest explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, why did Jesus Christ die for our sins? Well, frankly, there was no other way for payment to be made for your sins. I don't know what you grew up being, being taught or what you grew up believing. I grew up in a Protestant church as a kid, but it was, it was modernist in its theology. We had the idea that if maybe somehow we could do enough good works, and let's say my right hand represents the good stuff, and the left hand is the bad stuff. If we could somehow do enough good, and maybe the good would tip the scale against the bad deeds done in our life, you know, maybe we'd find favor with God. Well, you know, interesting thought. Years ago, somebody challenged me with a parenting principle. That is, try to practice ten parts of praise for every one part of criticism or correction with your children. Ten parts of praise for every one part of criticism. You think, I can't even find that many things to praise. Well, the idea was keep looking for things to praise. When you're praising your kids for good, it'll be a lot easier when you have to correct them. But it is so easy to find wrong, isn't it? I got to think about it. If it's easy for us to find fault with our kids, what about almighty, holy, perfectly righteous God with you and me? See, there's none that doeth good. No, not one. We don't get to heaven by being good. He says we're all as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Our iniquities, our sins, like the wind have taken us away. I'll never get to heaven being good. And by the way, you won't either. Nobody will. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. We have this stain of sin against God. But he says this, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as crimson, they should be as white as snow. Huh, how does he do that? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. As the bird spread her wings to protect that brood, the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to die for my sins. Let me, let me speak very plainly to you. I'm going to speak for Rich Tozer. I know this. If I got what I deserve when I die, I would be forever separated from God in a place called hell. That's what I deserve. Speaking for me. And I'm going to tell you, if you got what you deserve, you would not get heaven. You'd be forever separated from God. You say, well, I'm not that bad. You and I judge good and bad based on man's opinion of right or wrong. Understand this, God is perfectly good. Well, I thought God's loving. Oh, he is. In fact, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he gives us the bird analogy. But then we have the battle analogy. Why don't you go back to verse 4. And this is not uncommon in, in Hebrew culture. They do mix metaphors all the time. You and I are taught in English not to mix metaphors. Well, they, they do it all the time. It's a different, there are different rules, okay? So we switch like that from bird to battle, okay? Look at the end of verse 4. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. All right, now notice he mentions shield and buckler. These are, these are army terms. 
ancient army. A shield, this would be a full-length body shield. This is not, kids, this would not be like a Captain America shield, you know, like it would protect a little bit of your body. This is a full-length shield like you'd see ancient warriors, they'd go out to battle and they'd have these shields that were, you put them side by side, they'd literally form a wall. The term buckler has to do with a, a, a shaped shield. It would be like a semicircle, and it would protect you from various angles. Interestingly, not from behind. If you turn around and try to run, you're not protected. But it protects you from anything coming at you from the front or the side. Buckler. And then notice, he talks about in verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Interesting, God always starts with evening. Remember, evening and morning were the first day. Okay, so the terror by night. War would be scary in any circumstance, but fighting at night? I mean, this is before there's night vision technology, okay? You'll not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Okay, arrows, that would be like bullets flying in our day. That'd be like bombs being tossed at you or IEDs. You're not going to be afraid for the terror by night or the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Interesting. Just like a term used earlier with the birds, pestilence, widespread disease. I read uh, David McCullough's book, 1776, on George Washington's experience at Valley Forge. It's amazing. A very minimal amount of the country was in favor of separating from England at the time. Good thing the, uh, the minority did not lose out. George Washington's troops were there at, at uh, Valley Forge. Many of them didn't even have shoes. Their shoes had worn off their feet. There was no money to pay for arming the troops. Many of them got sick with dysentery. Washington lost more troops at Valley Forge through disease than he did through battle. It's always been a, ba it's always been a, yeah, a battle in war. Disease takes many soldiers. I want to tell you something. Satan wants to destroy churches from within. Sometimes it's not external attack. It's disease of the soul. Like Psalm 103 talks about, he healeth all our soul's diseases. Man, we need deliverance in our soul. Uh, he'll deliver thee from the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Here's why it's called the soldier psalm. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. I remember going back and doing some research on why is it called the soldier psalm. And interesting, in both World Wars I and II, there are some classic illustrations of God's protection. But I'll give you just one. It came out of World War II. It was before the United States had entered the war, but it was the Battle of Dunkirk. Many of you have heard of the Battle of Dunkirk. Troops were caught on the beaches there in France. Again, not Normandy. This is not the Normandy invasion. Early part of the war. French and English troops are, are pinned down on the beach in France, and it looks like they're about to be decimated. And there are hundreds of thousands of them. At the time, it was King George VI who was king in England. And he said, and apart from a sovereign miracle, our troops will be destroyed. And he begged people all over the British Empire, go to churches, pray for a miracle. So they did. All over, uh, all over the UK, all over the British Empire. In fact, here in the United States, too. People implored God for a miracle. And God delivered to about four miracles in connection with Dunkirk. The first one is fascinating. Hitler ordered the advancing German armored unit to a halt. Now, if you study history, it is incredible how many times God providentially intervened in world affairs. Uh, the Spanish Armada is an example that comes to mind. I think of George Washington during the French and Indian War. Uh, one, one chief personally shot at George Washington over a dozen times. He called Washington the man that God would not let die. Fascinating story. I mean, there are stories like this all through history. In World War II, there are a number of times that Hitler made what would become fatal errors for the Nazi cause. Well, he caused the German armored unit to halt. Now, why? Well, it's connected with another divine intervention. There was an unprecedented storm that settled over France at that time. This was not the time of year that there would be these torrential rainstorms, but a horrific rainstorm had settled over France. So that limited the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, from flying, and Hitler wanted air support for his ground troops, so he said, okay, halt to the German armored unit. Now there's a storm over France, but then there's a third miracle. The waters over the English Channel were completely calm. Now there's a storm going on, a violent storm over France, but the waters over the English Channel connecting France and Britain are calm. 
In fact, this is where most people know about Dunkirk. There was an evacuation that employed not only naval craft, not only military craft, but just any ships, vessels, sailing vessels of any kind were conscripted and used to bring people from the beaches of France and carry them back to England. And this went all day long. Naval vessels, there were private fishing vessels, private pleasure craft that were used, and troops were being loaded on these ships and taken out of France as quickly as possible. The fourth miracle, there's a group of 400 soldiers, a division of 400 men that were just pinned down on the beaches there in France, they were being strafed with German machine gunners. Uh, they were being bombed. This particular group had committed to memory Psalm 91. And in unison, they began to quote the psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Going on down, a thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Interestingly, not one individual of that 400 received even a scratch in that battle. All 400 of them survived unscathed. By day's end, listen to this, over 388,000 troops had been evacuated from the beaches of France in the battle at Dunkirk. 388,200 plus evacuated from Dunkirk. That's an incredible testimony to the sovereign intervention of God. You say, well, that's it. I'm going to memorize that psalm. <laughs> COVID, highway crashes, ha, military service, no problem. I got my fetish. Okay, does that mean if we put this in a gold encrusted chain around our neck and we kind of rub it every so often that we're good? How, how are we to look at this psalm? Well, I want to finish with this. We read earlier down to verse 7, but I'll pick up in verse 8. And here's the last area we'll look at a promise elaborated. A promise elaborated. Notice verse 8. Let me read the context from 8 to 16, since we didn't do it earlier. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Now, let me make you think as we're going along here. Only with thine eyes shall see the reward of the wicked. Let me ask you, what is the reward of the wicked? You probably know the wages of sin is death. God hath no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Okay, So, only with your eyes you'll see... The reward of the wicked. I was listening to the testimony of a man the other night, evangelist Glenn Schunk, and uh, he got saved just before he was drafted to go into World War II. And he said when he was in World War II, he was a brand new Christian, and he would try to witness to everybody he could. And he said guys were always, he was assigned to a machine gun detail, and he said I was a machine gunner, and he said I had guys wanting to be with me all the time because everybody knew Glenn didn't get shot. He said, God protected me through that war. And he said, I had more guys come. And he said, every one of them I'd witnessed to because I knew they weren't leaving. You know, and if they did leave, are they prepared? But he said, they're not going to crawl out of the machine gun nest. It's too dangerous. He said, I had men to whom I witnessed, and some of them died minutes after they got out of that nest. He said, God didn't let me receive a single scratch until at the end of the war, he finally took some shrapnel, took him out of that action. He went to a hospital where he and some others started a Bible study and many others came to saving faith in Christ. Huh. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. All right, go on to verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Now, let me just comment there. This isn't, well, you just quote the psalm, you're good. He says, if you've made the Lord your refuge, like I, the psalmist, have made him mine, there no evil befall thee. Here's a question. Have you come to know the Lord as your personal Savior? You can't appropriate this psalm in its fullness if you don't first know the Savior yourself. You've made the Lord your habitation. Well, then he's going to be your refuge. Look at verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. All right. So what do we learn here? Now let me give you this under the promise elaborated. First, there is exemption from evil. 
verses 8 to 10. Exemption from evil. I just finished reading the story of Corey Ten Boom. So if you remember her family lived in Holland during World, World War II, leading up to World War II. They were strong Christians. They knew that God had promised to bless them that bless Israel and curse him that curseth them. So he said, uh, their dad said, you know, we're going to protect these Jews. The Jews at that time were being assigned stars of David. Okay, and then they were being sent to ghettos. And rumor was they were being sent to work camps. And word was just getting out that people were being exterminated, gassed in the chambers. And so Corey Ten Boom's family did everything they could to give safe harbor to Jews, and it was at personal protection, personal peril rather, to themselves. And I want to say something to you. Where is that kind of courage in our day? Listen, you don't think you're affected by the present uh, dilemmas, the present culture. Let me tell you something. It was telling to me that last year, Many times it's the older people showing up at church, you know, hey, COVID, whatever, if I die, I die. I want to tell you, we have been afflict, affi- afflicted by snowflake mentality. We're wilting under the possibility that something could happen. Something could always happen. But nothing can happen to you as a child of God that's outside of his control. And he promises no evil's going to come your way. So Corey Ten Boom and her family, they would study God's word together. They would have family devotions. They would recite this psalm, Psalm 91, all the time. In fact, the day finally came, the whole family was arrested. They were taken off to a, a local jail to be processed there. And their father, the night, the last night they were all together, he had them stand in the jail and hold hands, and they recited Psalm 91. A week later, the dad died in a, in a jail. Corey and one of her sisters, Betsy, were sent, first of all, to a a jail there in Holland. Later, they were transferred to Ravensbrück in Germany. They were assigned to labor. They were working in sewing, seamstress work, etc. Corey, Betsy's sister, was desperately ill, in danger of her life. Corey would sometimes despair. Why has God let this happen to us? We were trying to protect his people. And Betsy would tell her, Corey... God never promised that we would be delivered from all trouble. He promises many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them out of them all. That's Psalm 34, 19, by the way. He, he didn't say you wouldn't have any trouble. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them out of them all. Sometimes he delivers in ways we expect, and sometimes he delivers in ways we don't expect. She said, Corey, I believe you will survive this war. She said, and I believe you will go all over the world telling people what happened and of God's forgiveness She said, what about you, Betsy? Betsy said, I don't know that I will survive. But she said, I know this. God will take care of us. He'll keep us here as long as he sees fit. Interestingly, they were assigned to a barracks where there were fleas in the barracks. And Corey would complain, why did God allow us to have this inconvenience on top of everything else? And Betsy said, sister, don't you realize the guards do not come into this camp, into this dorm, because of the fleas. We can have any communication here we want. They started Bible studies in their dorm. Many of their fellow uh, inmates were led to saving faith in Jesus Christ, some just before they themselves went to the gas chambers. God working in protection. I'll come back to that story. Bruce, that's usually where I tell the story about the D.C. sniper, but I don't have time to get into that one. Uh, then I want to give you this. Number, letter B is angelic attention, verses 11 to 12. Angelic attention. Notice, he shall give his angels charge over that he keep thee in, all, uh, keep thee in their hands. They shall, I'm sorry, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. That is the only scripture you ever find Satan quoting. And if you remember, Satan quotes it in context with Jesus when he was tempting Jesus. All right? Interesting. He Twist it out of context. Well, throw yourself off the temple mount here because after all, he'll give his angels charge over thee. In other words, you're the son of God. You're too important for anything to happen to you. Just throw yourself off and watch God move heaven and earth to save you. Does God mean if I jump out into busy traffic on I-95 and say, ha, nothing can happen to me, I'm a Christian, that I'm not going to get run over? God is not promising protection in the midst of presumption. But here's the deal. You are perfectly preserved by God until his plans for you are finished. I want to make a statement. Listen, you are, as it were, indestructible until God's through with you. This is why we don't need to live in fear. 
Oh, I'm so anxious. What, be careful for how much? Nothing. I'm so concerned. What, what if COVID kills our family? There's nothing can happen to you as God's child apart from His protection. Well, but, but if you're foolish, yeah, does foolish mean never leave your house? Let me just give you a little perspective. You are twice as likely to die from driving a car as you are from getting COVID. One out of every 105 people in America dies in a car accident. Less than half a percent die of COVID. Think about this. When I've, I've gone into some places where, you know, the mass Nazis have um, amassed, and if it's not required and I feel like I can keep a safe distance from people, I'll go in without a mask. This is not in your state that's required, okay? But if I'm in Florida, you know, and I, I was ready if I were to get the lecture, oh, you're not going to kill people. Listen, first of all, if you stay over there 25 feet and don't come here, you're probably less endangering yourself, okay? I'm all for doing what we can to be precautious, but I would like to ask the person, are you willing to give up driving? I'm twice as likely to die from your driving as you are from my being out in public. Now, I don't mean that to be unkind. We just need a little perspective, okay? I'm fine, look, wash your hands, wear a mask, do what you can to be protected, that's fine, but don't live in fear. We all take calculated risks. Do people ever die in airplanes? Yes, but we've all calculated and said, you know, I'd much rather take the risk and go see Grandma and Papa or make that trip to Disney World than, you know, than not ever fly. Is it all that risky to go to church? Statistically, not. Now again, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you when there are legitimate medical reasons. If your immunity is compromised, my daughter is dealing with vertigo right now. That's why she's not in church today. Did I get on her? Well, just trust God, Heather, go to church. No, there are times you've got to take care of some needs, okay? There's balance. But fear is not part of the equation for the Christian. We're not to live in fear. There's exemption from evil. There's angelic attention. He promises, Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. There's protection from predators. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. David Brainer was a missionary to the American Indian, the Native Americans. One day he was out in the leaves in the woods praying fervently that God would save this tribe of people that he was seeking to win. The tribal chief was watching Brainerd. He was looking for a chance to kill him. He saw him as a white intruder and he thought, this man does not have our interest in mind. Brainerd was concerned with their eternal interest, but the chief didn't understand that. So he and the braves are ready to attack. Behind Brainerd comes a rattlesnake. The snake coils and the chief thinks to himself, that snake is going to attack this man. The great spirit of the sky has sent a predator to take out the intruder. But then the snake relaxed his strike position and moved off. And then the chief thought, for some reason, the spirit of the sky saved this man. Maybe his message is important. Brainerd later witnessed to that chief and his tribesmen. They all came to saving faith. And the chief said, one of the reasons is we saw protection from predators in your life. I wonder, are people seeing you trust God or cower in fear? There's a last area here. That's deliverance for the devoted. Look at verses 14 to 16. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will be with him. Uh, I'll set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me. I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Deliverance for the devoted. So does that mean if you're a Christian, hey, listen, you'll never die of COVID? No, I think all of us have known people that died of COVID. I, we had a man in our church, healthy as anybody else, 80 years old, had been a deacon in our church, one of the greatest men in my church congregation. He, he died of COVID this year. You know, I, I've had friends who've been um, hospitalized because of it. But it's not just COVID. I mean, my own mom is dealing with cancer right now, and they've said she has six months to a year to live. Well, she's in month seven right now, but I expect any day that my mom will be taken home. She's 76 years old. Well, yeah, what about that? You know, I mentioned uh, Jim Elliott. He went to the Alka Indians and died. He and four other missionaries attempting to reach the Alka. It's a great story his wife wrote called um, Through Gates of Splendor. Elizabeth Elliott wrote that biography. Fascinating story. And Jim Elliott and his cohorts wanting to, wanting to reach the Alka Indians, and they were all thrust through with spears by the Alkas who were felt threatened by outsiders. But interestingly enough, Jim's wife, Elizabeth, and the missionary pilot, Nate Satan, had a sister named Rachel. They went into that tribe later 
and won the entire tribe to saving faith in Christ. Okay, so why did God protect Elizabeth but not Jim? Why, why Rachel but not Nate? Nothing can happen to you outside of the permission of God if you'll put yourself under his protection and in line with his principles. But what if? We can't live life in the what ifs, the if onlys. By the way, Corey Ten Boom did get released from prison. And one week before, her sister Betsy died. So I guess Psalm 91 worked for Corey, but not for Betsy. Betsy wouldn't have told you that. She said, Corey, I believe God will probably allow me to be taken home while we're in prison. And you'll probably be released. And she said, but it's important everywhere you go, you, you spread the message of God's forgiveness. We don't conquer by hate, we conquer by love. And that was the message of Corey Ten Boom as she went all over the world. Why did I preach this today? I, I have preached this message more this year than I preached any other message. You know why? I'm not only concerned for our congregations being paralyzed by fear. I, if you think COVID's bad, what's going to happen when it becomes illegal to meet as Christians? Oh, that wouldn't happen. Oh, I don't know. I subscribed to Parlor, and all of a sudden, that site was taken down for weeks. It's interesting. Some of the people that I like to read and follow, cancel culture setting in and stamping them out. Huh. Yeah, but, you know, that's not going to happen for us. There is no promise that this world will be anything but trouble. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. He said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Who are you going to listen to? Fear? <laughs> Fauci? Or faith? God wants us to be a people of faith. Let's put our trust in him. Would you bow your heads with me? Thank you for your good attention this morning. Lord, I, I pray that you'd work in us in a mighty way. Remind us you are the almighty. You are the Lord. You are the lavish provider. You're the protector. And you've said, look, a thousand may fall at thy side. 10,000 may fall at thy right hand, but not, not you. It'll, I'll protect you. Help us to trust. Help us to find the balance. Yes, you want us to be responsible. Yes, we, we wouldn't go out with the flu or pneumonia and subject ourselves with uh, germs from other people. Same with COVID. But help us to find a balance. We don't give up driving for the rest of our life because of the possibility that we could die behind the wheel. We know we take calculated risks all the time. But I pray that we would put our trust in you and we'd submit to your principles. Protect us, provide for us, help us to be people of principle. Our heads are bowed, I wanna ask you this. Let me ask a general question. How many of you would say there was something in this message today I sure needed? Would you lift your hand? Something in the message today I, I sure needed, okay? That's just a general question. Well, let's get specific. How many of you have trusted the Lord as your personal savior? You know, you've made the Lord your refuge. You know that when you die, the gift of God is eternal life. You'll be with the Lord. You don't deserve it, but you know you'll be with the Lord because he is your Savior. Would you lift your hand if you know that to be true? You said, I know the Lord. I, I know I'll be in heaven. The Lord has saved me. All right, many hands. You may put them down. Maybe you could not raise your hand to that. Maybe you think, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know how people could say they know for sure they'll go to heaven because after all, I mean, how do you know if you're good enough? That's the problem. That's the problem. You'll never be good enough to get to heaven. You can only get to heaven being saved by the grace of God. We'd love to show you how today. You have to recognize your need. Is there anybody here today you'd say, please pray for me. I don't, I don't know if God has ever taken away my sins. I don't know if I've been forgiven by God. I'm going to ask pastor to help me, otherwise nobody's looking around right now. But the pastor and I will, will take note of who has this need, and we would love to pray for you. We will not embarrass you. We'd love to show you from God's word how you can be saved if you'd let us. Is there somebody today you'd say, listen, I have no idea what's going to happen when I die. I don't know if God has forgiven my sins. Pray for me. Would you quietly lift your hand where I could see it? Pray for me. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I saw one person say, yeah, I think that might be me. Is there anybody else like that? I don't know. Pray for me. I am concerned where I stand with God. 
If you're not certain you'd go to heaven, we'd love to sit down with you shoulder to shoulder. We'll sit down in one of the office rooms here, one of the Sunday school classrooms. We'll show you from the Bible how you can be saved. And I'd urge you to call upon the Lord to save you. You're not joining the Baptist church. That's not what we're asking you to do. You need a relationship with Christ. How many of you, as I'm giving this invitation, you're thinking of people you know, and you're thinking, I wish they would be saved. Would you hold up your hand? I've got somebody in my heart. Pray for them. Yeah, me too. Okay. I'll, I'll finish with this for Christians. How many of you would say, I was convicted in the message. I, I, I have been neglecting the personal time with God. I see that that's where this confidence comes from. I have a relationship with him, but I've ne neglected my fellowship with him. Either I have cut God off from speaking to me because of sin, or I've just neglected quiet time with God. Pray for me. I need to renew personal fellowship with my Savior. Would you lift your hand? You said, I was convicted of that today. I need that. Yeah, several. And how many then would be transparent to say, look, I, I have, I'm afraid I have made too many decisions out of fear and anxiety this year instead of trust. And obviously that's the core of this particular message. Pray for me. I need to choose not to be careful. I need to choose to cast all my care upon him. Would you lift your hand? That's what I needed to hear today. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. Would you all look up my way? I'd like to ask you to stand. I think I'll just do an instrumental invitation. Let's stand together, okay, with our heads. Uh, right now, not our heads about. I'll just give a brief invitation. I'm going to give a brief Sunday school or, or life group message because I, I knew some of you, this would be my only chance at with you. So I gave you the meat and potatoes in this message. But here's how we'll close. I like old-fashioned invitations for this reason. God resisteth the proud, he says, but he giveth grace to the... Humble, yeah. It's humbling to bow the knee before God. It's humbling to respond to him. I'm fine with you kneeling right there at your seat if you can kneel. There's, there's plenty of room to spread out and be distanced up here. But let's do this. I'd, I'd ask you now to bow your heads. I'm going to have our pianist to play. I'm going to ask, would you step out or turn right there at your seat? God spoke to you about a specific. Would you, if you're able, would you kneel before him and say, Lord, I'm listening I need your help. Would you do that now? God gives grace to the humble. There's room here at the front, what we often call the altar, a place to put yourself before God and say, Lord, here's what I need. I'd love if you'd ask him, Lord, speak to me in the message to come and then Monday and Tuesday as well. It won't be a long invitation, but if God's prompting your heart, would you respond to that prompt? Well, you survived an entire message with us today. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. And uh, we trust the video today has been a blessing to you. You know, every message that I preach, I always try to bring it back to the importance of, number one, telling people everywhere we go about Jesus Christ. And number two, making sure that we as individuals make our life with God, our personal walk with God, the most important thing of our day. If there's ever anything that we can do for you or your family to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, would you please reach out to us? You can visit our website, visitfaithway.com, and there you'll find a link to get in touch with us. And we'd love to hear from you. If you made a decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today, awesome, that's wonderful. We would love to be able to talk to you about that and give you some resources that can help you grow in your walk with God. So let us know if there's ever anything that we can do for you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.